All right, so here they're saying that the empirical formula, okay, of a compound is CH2O, right? If 0 0.0833 mole of the compound contains one gram of hydrogen, then find the molecular formula of the compound. So basically, you know that the idea of empirical formula is that if this is my empirical formula, I can say that this has taken some n times to give me the molecular formula, okay? So, or I can say that the empirical formula weight multiplied by n is going to give me my molecular uh, mass or molar mass, correct? So this is what I can say and what I intend to do here is find out this n, okay? Also, uh, it's like preaching to the choir. I know you guys are only experts on mole concept, right? This is a topic from way back, right? When we were first starting off our journey with 11th standard chemistry. So I know this is all good. Let's continue. So here they're saying that, so this is the number of moles of compound and this is the grams of hydrogen. Okay, so here they're saying that 0 0.0833 moles of the compound has one gram of hydrogen. So one mole will have how many grams of hydrogen is what I want to find out. Okay, because if I can find out the number of uh, grams or the weight of hydrogen in one mole of the compound, then I can find out the number of moles of hydrogen atoms in one mole of the compound, which means I can find out N which means I can find out the molecular formula, okay? That's what I'm going to do. So look here, so my x is going to come out 1 by 0 0.0833, okay? Now I really don't want to sort, uh, you know, solve this. So I hope you remember that every time we solve it in gaseous state, we take uh, when r is equal to 0 0.0812, right or 0 0.081 we generally approximate it to 1 by 12 correct i am going to do the similar approximation here i have 1 by 0 0.0833 i'm going to say that this is equal to 12 approximately okay so basically in one mole of the compound i have 12 grams of hydrogen okay so 12 grams of hydrogen is how many atoms of hydrogen or how many moles of hydrogen that is what you need to find out so 12 gram divided by 1 gram per mole so basically you have 12 moles of hydrogen atoms in one mole of the compound okay go back to the formula it says that your empirical formula has two moles of hydrogen so 2 into n is equal to 12 which means your n is equal to 6 correct so now my basically my entire molecular formula is going to come out to be this so it is C6H12O6 or as we common folk call it this is nothing but your glucose right so option B C6H12O6 is going to be the right answer to this question okay so here they're saying that for carbon dioxide given that the average velocity at T1 is equal to the most probable velocity at t2 they want the ratio of t1 by t2 okay so what is your average velocity formula average velocity is nothing but 8 rt uh, here they're saying t1 so i'll write t1 by pi m this is equal to the most probable velocity at t2 most probable velocity the formula is 2 rt2 so 2 rt2 by m okay they're saying these two are equal okay great now what I'll do is first I'll cancel out the constants. R is a constant, M is a constant because we are talking about carbon dioxide in both cases so it's going to be a constant. So now I will remove the square root, right? Or I'll simply square both sides. So I have 8T1 by pi is equal to 2T2, correct? So this will cancel out once, this will cancel out four times. So you have T1 by T2 is equal to pi by four. Pi is what? 3.14 so 3.14 by 4 that will give you 1 um, okay it will cancel out uh, let's see 31 so you will get um, still 0.7 okay so you get 0.7 so 28 and then you have what do you have you have 34 so let will go 8 5 okay so 0.785 is what we are getting option c has 0.78 right so definitely i'm going with it option c 0.78 is going to be the right answer to this question
Okay, so here they're saying that enthalpy of a reaction at 27 degrees Celsius is 15 kilojoule per mole. The reaction will be feasible if entropy is what? Right? So, you know that uh, for a reaction to be feasible, its Gibbs free energy has to be less than zero, right? So, your delta G has to be less than zero. So, not Gibbs free energy, sorry, change in Gibbs free energy has to be less than zero. You know that delta G is equal to delta H minus T delta S. So, this value has to be less than zero. So, I can say that T delta S has to be greater than delta H, okay, mathematically. Now, your delta H is given to you as 15 kilojoule per mole, but look at your options. They are talking about it in terms of joules. So, I will make it 15 into 10 to the power of 3 joule mole inverse. I'm going to keep my units aside because I know that units are going to pan out to something sensible. If they don't, we'll come back to it and we'll check. Okay, so here I have T delta S is greater than delta H. Delta H is 15 into 10 to the power of 3. Now, my temperature is given to me as 27 degrees Celsius. I will convert that to Kelvin. Uh, so this is going to be 273 plus 27. So this is 300 Kelvin, right? So you have 300 Delta S. So Delta S is going to be greater than 15 into 10 cube by 3 into 10 square. So this will go 5 times and this will come out like this so you get 50 okay now let's talk units so your delta h was joule mole inverse and then we did by temperature so kelvin inverse right so this is what we're getting delta s okay units are consistent like i already told you so delta s has to be greater than 50 uh, joule per mole kelvin so which means option c is what the answer looks like so option c is going to be the right answer to this question Okay, so here they're saying which one of the following is correct for isothermal expansion of an ideal gas. Okay, so one thing you need to remember about isothermal expansion is that it's a process that's carried out at constant temperature. It's a constant temperature process, which means dt is going to be equal to zero or delta t is going to be equal to zero. Okay, now when you look at the options, they are talking about u and h. So basically, they are talking about change in internal energy and change in enthalpy. You know that if I take some differential uh, sorry, not dt. If I take some differential du or if I even take delta u, you can take whatever you like, right? So du is going to be what? ncv dt and your dh is equal to ncp dt. Correct? One second. dt. Okay, so this is what you get. Now, you know that your dt is equal to 0, so this will become equal to 0. This will also become equal to 0, which means your du is equal to 0, your dh is equal to 0, or your delta u is equal to 0, your delta h is equal to 0, which means I can say that the amount of internal energy that I started with, that is going to be the amount of internal energy at the end of the reaction. The amount of enthalpy that I started with, that is going to be the amount of enthalpy at the end of the reaction. So basically, internal energy and enthalpy enthalpy do not change. U and H do not change, right? So that is the answer I'm going to go with. So option A, U and H increases? No. Option B, U increases but H decreases? No. Option C, U and H are unchanged? Yes, absolutely. This is what I was telling you. Option D, H increases but U decreases. So option D is also not it. Option C, U and H are unchanged is going to be the right answer to this question. All right, so here they're saying which one of the following is not a buffer solution. Okay, so before we dive into the question, what are buffer solutions? So first of all, buffer solutions are those that resist pH change for a considerable value. Okay, that's roughly the definition you can go with. There are two kinds of buffers, acidic buffers and basic buffers. Okay, so here... First thing you need to know is that one thing you could do is you could say that it is a weak acid plus salt of that weak acid with a strong base. Other way you could write it is you have a weak base plus its salt of that weak base with a strong acid. Understood? So these are your two kinds of buffers. If you don't see this happening in your options, then that will not be your buffer solution. Now, you have option A. 
0.8 molar H2S plus 0.8 molar KHS. Okay, so H2S is your weak acid. KHS is the salt of that weak acid with a strong base. So yes, this is a buffer and this is an acidic buffer. Okay, so this is a buffer solution. Now, option B, you have two molar C6 H5 NH2. What is the C6 H5 NH2? Aniline, right? So you have two molar uh, aniline solution and then you have uh, plus two molar C6 H5 NH3 plus Br, right? So it is forming a salt with uh, your bromide, which is nothing but going to be a strong acid. Okay, so here this is going to be a basic buffer. Cool. Then come to option C, you have 3 molar H2CO3 plus 3 molar KHCO3. Okay, so 3 molar of carbonic acid plus 3 molar of potassium bicarbonate. Carbonic acid, weak acid, uh, potassium bicarbonate. So potassium is going to correspond to a strong base KOH and your bicarbonate ion is the, uh, basically you have a salt of a weak acid with a strong base so this is again classic acidic buffer now you have option d 0 0.05 molar kclo4 plus 0 0.05 molar hclo4 so yes you have an acid and yes you have a solution of that acid in its salt form with a strong base okay but this is not going to be a buffer why is that so? Because here the acid that we are talking about is your HClO4. This is your perchloric acid, which is one of the strongest oxy acids of chlorine, right? Why? Because here chlorine is in plus 7 oxidation state, so really high oxidation state. So your HClO4 is a strong acid, right? If this were a weak acid plus salt of a weak acid with a strong base, only then can I call it a buffer solution. Here it will not be showing buffer action because it dissociates fully in the solution. So, point being, this is not a buffer and the question was asking for not a buffer, which means option D is going to be the right answer to this question.